Okay, well, let's get into 1 John. This first letter of John, while it doesn't name its author, very early tradition and church fathers uh, did hold to uh, the fact that John penned the letter, including Polycarp. And you must remember, he studied under John. And if Polycarp studied under John and he assigned this epistle to John the Apostle, uh, that's, that's pretty safe grounds, I would say, uh, to stand on. Now, Ignatius also claimed that John authored this letter. Interestingly, Irenaeus wrote that John recited in Ephesus. This is important also for the book of Revelation because it addresses the churches of Asia. Hence, it is more, li more than likely that the three epistles of John are addressing the same believers. Um, and we'll get into different views of that in, in the second epistle shortly. Moreover, we know that the beloved disciple implies John. You see that in his own gospel. Equally important is the fact that the author claims to have been an eyewitness of Christ. In chapter 1, the first four verses there, including having touched him, the word of life, and so forth. And, of course, he also says these are not invented fables, you know, uh, loose paraphrase. We actually saw the risen Lord, spent time with him, we've touched him. So the resurrection was absolutely a physical event. If not, you couldn't touch it. You can't touch a ghost. Spiritual resurrection is therefore false, and um, so on. So to assign this epistle as a second century document falls short since the eyewitnesses would have long you know, passed away long ago. And the fact that this epistle was quoted so widely in the second century, uh, it implies it would have to be written in the first century, at least at the near end of the first uh, century. In comparing the style and vocabulary in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John with the Gospel of John, there are also striking similarities there. So if we establish that John penned his Gospel, we can also uh, establish that these epistles are assigned to him as well. As for the dating of this epistle, as just mentioned, second century believers quoted from this letter. So to give it a first century date is reasonable. Furthermore, the kind of Gnosticism that John is responding to uh, is much more developed than what we observe in the epistles, for example, say of Peter and, uh, and Paul. These apostles refuted more a primitive, more of a primitive embryonic type of Gnosticism, uh, whereas John is, you know, living now, ready to pass on, to go to be with the Lord at the, at the close of the first century. The type of Gnosticism that he's responding to is um, mid-century and onward. Uh, and, of course, that was more developed than in second, third, fourth century for sure. It was flourishing by that time. Now, some date the book before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, but... Such an early date does not work because the heretical ideas that John is countering would not have had enough time to um, have been developed since it involved, it involved a more mature blend of Greek dualism and Eastern mysticism. As said before, um, we believe that prior to this, um, or to, to John's passing, um, he lived in, in Ephesus. In addition to this epistle having the tone of an older man and also calling its recipients little children uh, implies that he's probably old. Um, he does so multiple times, little children, little children. So to assign this letter a later date can be established on, on, on other grounds as well. Um, for example, uh, Paul visited Ephesus multiple times between AD 53 and 56. Then in AD 63, Timothy visited Ephesus with Paul as well. In fact, Timothy was still in Ephesus when Paul wrote him some three or four years later, right around AD 67. Yet we have no sources at all indicating that Timothy and John were at Ephesus at the same time. Thus, most uh, likely, you know, John moved to Ephesus later and penned his letter later. And... Um, John, having recognized, again, this whole thing about false teachers uh, that he uh, lashes out against uh, through the Holy Spirit, um, having recognized this threat of this Gnosticism and its infiltration by uh, false teachers, you know, uh, he sought to set the record straight once and for all very bluntly. Just like we read in Genesis, as God's image was placed on man and God claiming that all that he had made was good, the Gnostic view indicating that matter was evil was heretical. Now, when they said 
uh, matter is evil, it, it's not referring to a moral evil, okay? Matter doesn't think, you know, a table, a vein, a nail, fingers doesn't think on its own. So what that meant was sort of like envision a totem pole of dualism. You got spirit, you got mind, and then at the very bottom you got matter, you know, as close as you can get to non-being. That's what they meant by evil, not that it's, uh, uh, you know, intrinsically wicked in and of itself. Uh, probably some Gnostics held that as well, but uh, mainly it's um, a very low view of, of the physical nature of man, etc. So we see Paul in his first epistle to the church at Corinth addressing a primitive yet similar version of having a low view of matter. Remember the Corinthians? They're like, doesn't matter what I do to my body, my spirit's saved. And of course, they continued in some really, really grotesque sins uh, that the pagans wouldn't even <laughs> mention. Uh, so it's no wonder that we have a strong theology in his first epistle. Plus, John is old, been thinking about a lot of things and observed a lot of things changing uh, right before him, in particular heretical movements springing up left and right. So it's no wonder that he comes on so strong. John's message in First John is fourfold. One, he wanted the, the you know wanted the joy of his readers to be complete. So you need to ask yourself, do I have the joy of the Lord? You want that to be complete. So read chapter one verse four. And, you know, look at the commentaries, what they have to say about that, and do some cross-checking with other verses and, uh, and so on. Secondly, he admonished them to avoid sin, but also to ask for forgiveness if they did sin. In 1 John 1, 9 and chapter 2, verse 1. But 1, 9, you know, if we confess our sins to one another, he's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, etc. Number three, he wanted them to be able to refute false teachers. You have that in 2.26. Definitely a strong hint that we need apologetics today. You know, I don't, I don't separate Bible study and apologetics. I think the two go together. I mean, if you have it in the Word of God, why should we not do it in the pulpit? Uh, finally, he wanted them to know or be assured that they have eternal life. So when you're questioning your salvation, if you ever do, go back and read 1 John 5.13. You can rest assured that you have eternal life once and for all. It's just that sanctification process where we have our ups and downs. Sometimes we don't feel saved, but we are saved. Our feelings can change. Same thing happens in a marriage, but commitment doesn't, you know. So he's committed to you more than you and I are committed to him. And that's a good place. That's really great to know that Jesus even is praying for us and he's our advocate. Take those things to heart. John combated two different heretical views of Jesus in 1 John by emphasizing the two natures of Jesus Christ, the tr true humanity and true deity or divinity, if you will. And remember, we call that the hypostatic union. He says he heard, saw, and even touched Jesus, confirming the actuality of his humanity. You know, a spirit doesn't uh, a ghost can't be touched, you know, a spirit can't be touched. Remember at the Sea of Galilee, after his resurrection, he ate a piece of broiled fish. Thomas handled him as well, um, touching him and so on. So definitely physical resurrection. He pulled no punches saying that, John now, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. You have that in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. In fact, he said, all those who deny the humanity of Jesus is the spirit of the Antichrist. That's hardcore. That's chapter 4, verse 3. He also confirms the deity of Jesus, calling him the true God and eternal life in 5, verse 20, and affirming him as one member of the Trinity in 5, verse 7. Finally, in addition to refuting Gnosticism, John also assures the believers of eternal security. While some maintain, though, that John is stating the opposite in reading 1 John plainly following the historical, grammatical, interpretive style, the message of assurance is clear. In addition to that, you know, read um, 
Romans 8, 28 to 29 and 30. It looks like we're not, we don't have too much to do with it. <laughs> and that's good. Uh, I don't want much to do with salvation on my own. You know, uh, it's a gift from God, lest any man should boast. Even our faith is a gift. So praise the Lord for that. But uh, let's move on into uh, Second John. Just as we established before, uh, John authored his first epistle. The same arguments applied for and against is true of the second epistle. So you can look at the comments there. Again, if you're writing this down, you can mix that together. However, in the second letter, the writer identifies himself as the elder. I believe that's the elder John. Some claim that this elder is someone other than John. Um, yet the vocabulary and style in his first epistle matches that of the second letter. Thus, I believe John, uh, and most I mean, all conservative scholars believe uh, that John wrote this epistle as well. Having established now that John authored his first epistle somewhere between AD 67 and AD 98, 67 are the people, of course, that argue that he wrote it before the fall of, of, of the Jerusalem temple to the Romans. Um, but um, uh, it's for sure between AD 67 and 98. I go with the later date again. So um, the second letter was most likely written shortly, uh, I would maybe 91, 90 or 91, I think are safe dates. Um, now we can deduce that the recipients of the first letter, uh, who, who are they? Well, he addressed the churches in Asia. The second epistle names its recipients, who? Who's the recipient? The elect lady and her children. You have that in verse 1. So due to John's usage here of plural pronouns, some hold that he was addressing a body of believers, not a specific elected lady and her children. Hence, given this view, the figurative expression probably refers to a church in Southwest Asia Minor. On the other hand, John's personal greeting in the last verse um, seems to say that he was, um, um, you know, he was with the recipient's nephews and nieces. In that case, this strongly argues for this letter being personal, since such a greeting would be, you know, very, very odd if it was addressed to a large body uh, or a church, if you will. So while we can't be completely certain of who the recipients are, the message of John's second epistle is vivid and clear. To guard against false teachers, hold fast to the truth, as the heresy now of docetism has begun to emerge, uh, and false teachers sought to infiltrate the church with other forms of, you know, uh, more developed, uh, not so embryonic type of uh, Gnosticism that we saw earlier, John responds to these just like he refuted uh, the false teachings in his first letter. Moreover, the incarnation passage in uh, the Gospel of John, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the Word became flesh in verse 14. He added on the nature of, the, of humanity, you have the diophyses, the hypostatic union, so on, goes hand in hand with this epistle in its claim that anyone who claims that Jesus has not come in the flesh is a deceiver and an antichrist. Um, also, we have a Trinitarian uh, view expressed uh, in this letter based on the verbiage, at least two persons of the Trinity, Father and Son. In this sense, the two persons of the triune Godhead is evidently clear in this message, uh, and those who abide in Christ have both the Father and the Son. All right, uh, we will move right into Third John. And uh, just like the second epistle, the third letter identifies the author as the elder. Um, first letter doesn't mention the author, but with the second letter, you have elder. Third letter, elder. Uh, there are no real objections to John's authorship as we addressed in the first and the second epistle, other than arguments that the author could not address the kind of Gnosticism that we observe in these epistles. Um, but uh, we dealt with those ideas already, but uh, once more, there was an early, middle, and later developed Gnosticism. John is countering the end of the first century Gnosticism that began to flourish in the second century, whereas Paul, for instance, refuted an earlier embryonic stage, if you will, of these heresies. Thus, as for dating of this third letter, um, it must have been written near his death, very near his death, thus it's safe to say somewhere 
uh, you know, right before A.D. 100. Um, well, John's first epistle uh, seems to address the churches throughout Asia Minor. And the second letter, again, the same group or a specific group, uh, uh, the elect lady and her children. The third letter, no doubt, addresses an in individual namely Gaius. Gaius is asked to continue to show generosity and hospitality and to stand against the evil influences of Diotrephus. And if you remember, um, um, John, uh, you know, apparently John got word that Diotrephus was a man out of control who not only blocked one of John's prior letters from being read um, uh, to a specific you know, church body, uh, but Diotrephus not only hindered the words of John to these fellow believers, uh, but even threw people out of the church. So in order to put to stop his nonsense, John, while unable to show up in person, decided to write Gaius personally to ensure that the letter not only got its, to its proper location, but was also read. Gaius, it seems... Uh, must therefore have been a prominent member in that church, you know, um, with some some pull uh, against this other uh, Diotrephus. So John reminds the beloved Gaius um, not to imitate what is evil, but what is good. Uh, he who does good is of God, but he who does does evil is has not seen God. <laughs> As in verse 11, apparently one of these evils was was the case with Diotrephus. Uh, while there's no real theology to the letter, um, John encourages the body, you know, to the beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brothers and for strangers who are born witness of your love before the church. You have that in verse 5. Short little letter, sweet little letter. In any event, that wraps up the epistles of John. Next, we only have Jude and Revelation, and I think what I will do is I will email them to you tomorrow. And if you don't watch them by 11.59 p.m., um, no big deal. Uh, just, you know, browse through them, and, uh, but I'll get them to you tomorrow. Uh, meanwhile, Lord bless, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.